This book from 30 years ago does weirdly predict a lot of what we're seeing in society at the moment. It's called The Demon Haunted World and it's by Carl Sagan. I recently made a video about an exam that Carl Sagan taught at Cornell and it was all about critical thinking. This book builds off a lot of those ideas that Sagan had about the importance of critical thinking, how to teach it, and how it can protect us from falling into the darkness and mysticism of some of these anti-science ideas that sometimes seem so compelling to believe in. In this video, I'm going to take you through some of my favorite passages in this book, and that includes Carl Sagan's guide, which he called a baloney detection kit, on trying to spot when people are trying to trick us or when we might be starting to believe things that actually aren't true. And why is that important at all? You might think that you're smart enough to never fall for one of these scams or tricks, but pseudoscientific ideas are truly everywhere. Probably all of us encounter them on a pretty much daily basis, and probably all of us believe in at least some of them. Skeptical treatments of ideas are actually hard to find, and that's because they don't don't sell well. Someone who relies on popular culture to be informed about most things is much more likely to stumble upon an uncritical take on something than a full, balanced, and skeptical assessment of it. Sagan says that pseudoscience claims to use the methods and findings of science whilst in fact being faithless to its nature. Pseudoscience relies on insufficient evidence or ignores clues that point the other way. With the uninformed cooperation of newspapers, magazines, book publishers, radio, television, movie producers, and the like, such ideas are easily and widely available. Add to that list some of our modern means of sharing information, like YouTube and TikTok and online articles, and even AI and AI-generated content that is appearing here on YouTube as well. And it's more true than ever that, you know, these ideas, these addicting pseudoscientific and fantastical ideas that claim to be science or claim to be history even, well, they're just very prevalent. Pseudoscience differs from erroneous science. Science thrives on errors, cutting them away one by one. False conclusions are drawn all the time, but they are drawn tentatively. In science, you come up with hypotheses that can be disproved, and you go about trying to do experiments or look for data that can disprove them. Constantly coming up with ideas of what you think is gonna happen and being wrong and then building the theory again is how science moves and progresses. But in pseudoscience, they come up with hypotheses that can't be disproved. And when you do try to disprove the hypotheses, people get defensive. In pseudoscience, when the ideas fail to gain traction among scientists, instead of skeptically scrutinizing why, they would tend more often to claim there is a conspiracy against them or claim that the information is being suppressed for some reason. Sagan says that science is more than a body of knowledge, it is a way of thinking. He is afraid for a future where we fail to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, and we slide without noticing back into superstition and darkness. Sagan saw clues 30 years ago that pointed towards what he calls this slow decay. Um, and to him, it was things like seeing the prevalence of 30 second sound bites or lowest common denominator programming or credulous presentations of pseudoscience and superstition, but especially a kind of celebration of ignorance. Basically, in the first few chapters of this book, Sagan lays out why he is really concerned that we are becoming an anti-science society. And he doesn't want for the methods of scientific inquiry to be unknown. He wants everyone to know that they possess these abilities to approach any idea or problem in their life skeptically but also scientifically to test it out and, and to practice the scientific method themselves. And this isn't just because he loves science and in the sense that he loves finding out new things or learning about the universe and our place in it, but he really does believe it's important to improve the lives of everyone. He says that science can be the golden road out of poverty and backwardness for emerging nations. It makes national economies and global civilization run. Many nations understand this. It is why so many graduate students in science and engineering at American universities are from other countries. And on the other hand, something that the United States sometimes fails to grasp 
is that abandoning science is the road back into poverty and backwardness. And so with so much at stake, let's take a look at Sagan's guide for how to approach and to critically examine new ideas. First, wherever possible, there must be independent confirmation of the facts. Two, encourage substantive debate on the evidence by knowledgeable proponents of all points of view. Three, arguments from authority carry little weight. Authorities have made mistakes in the past. They will do so again in the future. Perhaps a better way to say it is that in science, there are no authorities. At most, there are experts. Spin more than one hypothesis. If there's something to be explained, think of all the different ways in which it could be explained. Then think of tests by which you might systematically disprove each of the alternatives. Try not to get overly attached to a hypothesis just because it's yours. Quantify. If whatever it is you're explaining has some measure, some numerical quantity attached to it, you'll be much better able to discriminate among competing hypotheses. If there's a chain of argument, every link in the chain must work, including the premise, not just most of them. Occam's razor. This convenient rule of thumb urges us, when faced with two hypotheses that explain the data equally well, to choose the simpler, and always ask whether the hypothesis can be, at least in principle, falsified. Propositions that are untestable, unfalsifiable, are not worth much. And then, of course, there is also the importance of carefully designed and controlled experiments. We're not going to learn much from just contemplating ideas, but we will learn a lot from designing experiments to possibly disprove them. Being a well-known planetary scientist involved with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, a lot of what Sagan was combating in the public eye was theories of UFOs. And he points to crop circles and how a lot of people have actually confessed to faking crop circles, to doing it as kind of a practical joke, to try and trick people who are gullible to UFO theories and, and kind of doing it for fun. But even though these confessions are well documented, they simply don't get airtime. They're simply not publicized anywhere near as much as the crop circles themselves. So it's very possible that people hear about the mystery of crop circles, but are never presented with these confessions. Why is that? It is again because skepticism doesn't sell as well, but particularly in this case, it's not just a skeptical take on the idea, it's having to show these people who are, I guess, morally corrupted, you know, someone who's done something to make fun of other people, well, giving them airtime is, is kind of a painful thing. It's an emotional impact to tell people they've been tricked by these by these others who they're not going to like, they're not going to want to hear from them, they're not going to want to see the interviews with these people who they're going to consider to be detestable. Any news outlet that published information about the crop circles themselves or any other thing similar to this will then have to face the humility of confessing that they were tricked too and that they publicly broadcast a hoax. Sagan says that the tools of skepticism are generally unavailable to the citizens of our society. They're hardly ever mentioned in the schools, even in the presentation of science. Those who have something to sell, those who wish to influence public opinion, and those in power do have a vested interest in discouraging skepticism. Science communicators play a role in this story of sharing information and bringing awareness to science. But as Sagan says in the book that it's not really enough to just popularize scientific principles and our, our ideas that, you know, that the kind of end results that we've learned over the years. Instead, what's more important to share are the methods of science so that people know what this process of science really is and and understanding that method is far more important than just understanding the findings of science. The book mentions quantum mechanics as a particularly tricky case because to really understand the math behind quantum mechanics and to understand the physics takes maybe up to 15 years worth of study. That's studying all of the mathematical underpinnings all the way from vector calculus to matrix algebra, mathematical physics, like there's so much background knowledge to be built upon when wanting to understand quantum mechanics. Combine that with the fact that quantum mechanics is counterintuitive. 
it results in things that seem really mysterious. It sets this kind of dangerous precedent where now if you have say some kind of pseudoscience or kind of a new age guru making claims, maybe even relating to, to the results of quantum mechanics, well that guru could also claim that to really understand their system would take 15 years of hard and intense study and you know that's unachievable for most people so in when being told that you are I guess having to just trust in that system. Sagan says that in this case the bamboozle would have free reign. What really is the difference between that new age scheme and quantum mechanics? The answer is that even if we cannot understand it we can verify that quantum mechanics works. We can compare the quantitative predictions of quantum theory with the measured wavelengths of spectral lines of the chemical elements, the behavior of semiconductors and liquid helium, microprocessors, which kinds of molecules form from their constituent atoms, the existence and properties of white dwarfs, what happens in lasers, and which materials are susceptible to which kinds of magnetism. We don't have to understand the theory to see what it predicts. In every one of these instances, the predictions of quantum mechanics are strikingly and to a high accuracy confirmed. But the shaman tells us that his doctrine is true because it too works. He claims he can cure people. So then we'd have to hold him to the same standard, demand the statistics on his cures and see if they work better than placebos, compare the efficacy of alternative systems. We don't necessarily have to understand every part of the why of why something is working, whether it's physics or otherwise, but we do need to be able to have the confidence that comes from making predictions and testing them. There is though a kind of sad lesson to keep in mind and that Sagan summarizes like this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply sometimes too painful to acknowledge that we've been taken for a ride, especially the longer that that has gone on and the more we deeply believed in it. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. So the old bamboozles tend to persist as the new ones rise. Because of this, I think that one of our best hopes in changing the culture of how people engage with science is in education and in helping people to have that toolkit of assessment when encountering new ideas for the first time. A skeptic is not going to be closed off to new ideas, but instead should have a combination of curiosity or creativity and some skepticism because those two together mean that you're open to new ideas but as long as they can be critically assessed. I like a quote in here that says you should keep an open mind but not so open that your brain falls out. The world is changing so quickly at the moment and that can lead to frustrations in the education system because Teachers are, you know, teaching students who are dealing with technologies and things in their world, like for example AI, that wasn't around when the teachers learned from their teachers, you know, how to use it and how to deal with it. It's almost like we can't rely on the passing down of information in this streamlined way from one generation to the next, like you may have been able to do with things a little bit more in the past. Instead, it's not about passing down information, it's about teaching each generation how to learn. I mean even Sagan is giving an example about how he would teach a child and he says you know if, if a child asks a question and you don't know the answer you can go to an encyclopedia or if you don't have an encyclopedia you can take the child to the library. Now we have a lot more options than even that but still the philosophy of learning from Sagan's time is the same. He talks about instead of teaching science as a way to memorize a rigid structure of material. Instead, take a look at the works of scientists, their original contributions, the way that they wrote or experimented or got things wrong or how they dreamed up ideas. We can read the creative works of scientists, both current day and from the past, and we can each do our best to continue to talk about science. We also have to try and remember all of the times that mysteries were in fact solved, that people confessed to, to running shams, and remember the times that either as individuals or collectively we were misled about something. The world is messy 
and hard to keep up with, but by remembering some of these principles of critical and skeptical thought, we can at least each try to do our best to make good choices about what we believe in. Thank you to Brilliant for supporting my channel by sponsoring this video. Brilliant helps you to hone your scientific thinking and problem solving with thousands of visual interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. I appreciate Brilliant for the work that they do in keeping science front of mind for people and in providing new ways to learn. Their course on scientific thinking is like a mini playground of testing hypotheses and correcting until you understand why something works. And on Brilliant, after mastering the foundations, you can attempt increasingly challenging problems. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash tibbies, or scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant's given my viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited access to everything on Brilliant. Thanks also to my Patreon supporters, and a special shout out to today's Patreon Cat of the Day, Alice.